And it's, it's ongoing, it's all the time. You can find this everywhere. And there I am in the middle of it all. And they never invite me to their church to speak. It's very sad. <laughs> So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Christianism and, and its his history in the United States. And I think the peculiar history of Christianism is part of the answer of why we've got so much of it. Uh, and then I'm going to say a little bit about uh, how we are using the internet to fight back. And the idea there is this is something you guys can do in Norway as well. That, uh, Sure, you may be sitting there all smug and confident and think, well, there's no way creationists will ever take off here. Uh, I would have said the same thing in the United States if I'd been around 50 to 100 years ago. Uh, it, it, it's very surprising how quickly it can take over an entire country. Well, first thing I want to mention, though, is, is one of the peculiar things about the United States is, is we have this Constitution, and you know we're one of the few states around where the Constitution explicitly says there's a separation of church and state. We lay it right there, out there in the First Amendment that the United States government should have nothing to do with the establishment of religions. And when you look back at the founders of the country in, 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 in the ages of the Enlightenment, uh, it's clear when you read their writings outside of the document of the Constitution that that was their idea, is that no, we don't want religion and government getting entangled. So it's a peculiar situation because here we get this explicit statement that no, you cannot have creationism and government all tie tied together. And if you ever go to the United States, you will discover it is everywhere. It is all tangled up. Our president has things like the National Day of Prayer, where he's getting out there and actually endorsing a fairly right-wing Christian version of, of America's founding. Uh, that when you go to the schools, you will find a constant battle to get creationism, which is fundamentally a religious idea, taught in the schools. So it's very strange. You know, I, I, I sometimes think that maybe we should have a state religion and we just end all the problems right there. Uh, it seems state religions are a great way to totally emasculate a religion. <laughs> well, despite all these problems, you know, we've, we've got a pretty good legal history. And I'm just going to mention a few things here. Uh, in the United States, we've had lots and lots of uh, legal challenges to creationism and to evolution. And so far, the good guys have won every one of them. Except for the first one, the Scopes trial back in 1925, but that was okay. We've, we've, we've made up a lot of ground that since then. Uh, it, it's a peculiar thing again that in the United States we have so much legal precedent that excludes creationism from the classroom. Yet still, the battle goes on. Uh, I'm just listing a few of the major decisions that have been made over the years. This uh, Epperson versus Arkansas, for instance, was a Supreme Court decision. So this is a decision that is binding across the entire country. And what Epperson said was uh, that you cannot exclude evolution from the curriculum because of religious preferences. So it says you, you've got to include evolution you know, as a scientific principle in the schoolroom. Uh, Edwards versus Aguilar, the other one in boldface there, is another Supreme Court's decision which uh, really hit them hard because in that decision, uh, that was a bunch of creationists who brought forth a, a, a case where they said, Okay, you can teach evolution, but we want to teach creationism as an alternative theory. And in Edwards versus Aguilar, uh, the Supreme Court plainly said, no, you can't do that. that. That's clearly a religious principle. Creationism is a religious idea, and you cannot introduce that into the public school classroom. But like I said, uh, it's this curious thing. You know, that's, that's a clear-cut case. It says, no, you cannot teach creationism as an alternative theory. But these other cases, you can see it's still coming up. Pittsmiller versus Dover was the infamous Dozer, Dover trial a couple of years ago, and it was exactly the same thing. It was a school district in Pennsylvania that tried to bring creationism into the classroom as an alternative theory, something that had already been banned in 1987, and it just keeps coming back. So my feeling about this is laws are the wrong way to do this that you cannot legislate what people should believe or understand. We are currently using the law as sort of a last minute barrier to prevent them from officially taking over the public schools. But it's really not changing public sentiment at all. Uh, if you look at what Americans think about creationism and evolution, you get numbers like this. Uh, these, these, are, these are terrifying numbers. Uh, this is where you just go out and you ask people what they think of uh, these ideas. Yes, okay, first throw one up there at the top. Ask, uh, evolution, that is the idea that human beings developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life. Yes, I'm a 
if you agree with that. And what you find is that overall, 53% uh, will say yes, so about half. 44% uh, say it's false. So 44% of the American public will come out and tell you that no, we did not evolve. Uh, the alternative here is creationism, the idea that God created human beings pretty much in that present form at one time within the last 10,000 years. And there what you find is 66% say that that's true. Now if you're, if you're an integrative thinker and you're looking at this slide and you're thinking about the interpretations here, uh, you might notice that 44% uh, disagree with evolution and 66% say that creationism is true. There's a little bit of overlap there. There's apparently a number of people in the United States who think both that evolution is true and that God created them 6,000 years ago. Just that alone, that, that kind of warns you that we're, we're on flake territory here. So there's, there's a surprisingly substantial amount of support for creationism. Uh, I don't expect you Norwegians followed the American elections the, the last time. There was a debate when they, uh, the moderator actually asked the Republican candidates how many of them believed in creationism. And something like uh, half the candidates for the presidency on the Repub Republican side were proud to say that yes, they believe that God created us 6,000 years ago. So it's everywhere. In addition to everywhere, uh, here's another set of scary numbers. This is a set of polls that were made. In blue is, are the answers for the general public. In red is high school biology teachers. So these are the people who are teaching our kids. And they gave them these, these three different possibilities that human beings have developed over millions of years, but God had no part in this process, which is obviously the correct answer. <laughs> or human beings have developed over millions of years, but God guided this process. This is kind of a theistic evolution sort of idea. This is sort of this compromise idea. And the other one is God created human beings pretty much as they are within the last 10,000 years. And the scary thing is that 16%, about a sixth of our high school science teachers, <coughs> believe in that. Okay, and that's just the ones who explicitly believe in creationism. Um, a fellow at my university, at the University of Minnesota, uh, has been, Randy Moore, has, has been doing a study, a survey of, of students' experiences in high school, and what he's finding is that about a third of the high schools in the state of Minnesota are introducing creationism into the science curriculum. Not officially, it's just a teacher says, well, you know, this, this is this other idea, I'm going to talk about this other day, and they really talk about it, uh, and teach the students creationism. So a third of our state is, is getting that kind of thing. Uh, so that's not so good. Now, uh, I should mention, though, that all of these numbers are strangely fuzzy, and they're a little bit easy to, to shape. It turns out that if you ask these questions in terms of humans, if you ask, you know, if you change that to humans, if, you, if you've got humans there, you get this set of numbers, but it turns out if you, if you change humans to dogs, for instance, and ask about the evolution of dogs, uh, suddenly there's a clear majority that favors the idea that evolution guided in the production of, of dogs. It's just, it's a very personal thing. So humans are the exceptions in all of these sorts of things. So it's really people who are resentful of the idea that evolutionists are telling that their great-grandmother was a monkey. <laughs> but I'll get to more of that in a little bit, this, this strange human exceptionalism. The real problem is, is I think it's, it's one of communication. That uh, what we have going on right now is a bit of a divide in that here we've got this scientific information that clearly says why that first one is the correct answer, as I said, uh, but it's not getting out to people. What's getting out to people is a well-organized body of misinformation coming from creationists. That what we've got is a public, an American public that isn't stupid, okay? Most creationists are not fools. They're ordinary people who honestly are not that interested in science and evolution anyway. And that's okay. We don't expect the majority of any nation's citizenry to be focused on this one discipline of science. So we've got this, this, this receptive public that is sitting there listening to messages. And what's happening is that they're getting uh, lots and lots of messages from movement creationists, people who are adamant, who are fanatical about their beliefs 